Ellen West Cork Art Centre Podcast. Hello, my name is Gavin Buckley. I'm speaking to you from Skibbereen, County Cork, Ireland, where I work as a part of the front of house team at Ellen West Cork Art Centre. I've been working at the centre for a couple of years now, and the wonderful people working there have gone above and beyond to help me pursue subjects of great interest to me, namely blog writing and podcasting. Both of those fields afford me the opportunity to interact with the wide variety of artists that become associated with the centre through residencies and exhibitions. This time around I got to speak with systems interference artist Michal O'Connell. Michal is currently on a residency here at Ireland, so I caught up with him to chat about his background with art as well as the ideas he's pursuing these days. Hello Michal, thank you for coming on. Thank you for the invite, Gavin. Good no to problem. talk to you. Thank you. Um, we met so a few years ago, right, for a short um, chats didn't we we and, did yeah uh, a very a very sharp but very interesting chat there yeah back in 2019 before all the the world's current mess happened it was very interesting to talk to you about um your perspective on the simple things in life and how they can be turned into something beautiful which is wonderful um so for the people that don't know you haven't met you can you give yourself or give them a bit of an introduction about yourself in terms of um what people call art. I, um, I've been at the kind of activities I do now for about 10 years. And then for about 10 years before that, I was pursuing other kinds of artistic objectives. And I completed a master's degree in fine art and um, set up a set up, I got, got involved with using, I began to use um, the world around me and um, in particular, certain kinds of technology, but not just the technology on its own. But then um, in about 2008, 2010, something quite significant happened. And from that point onwards, I've engaged using a similar approach to the world. Do you want me to elaborate a bit on that or is it too vague? Yeah, if you are comfortable talking about that event, that'd be great. So. I was uh, involved in um, artistic activities, mixing with certain people, discussing with them, and also teaching in photography-oriented courses, and also, um, you know, with technology generally, interactive gaming, that kind of thing. And um, I, I mean, the background to this is that I, I, I don't have a car now. I, I part of a car club and I hire a car when I need one um, mm -hmm. and uh, at the time I had a small car which I loaned to someone I won't mention who but they borrowed the car to go to London for the day I live 50 miles south of London on the south coast and um, whilst they were there um, they picked up a ticket for driving in a bus lane I didn't know about this until weeks later when I received a letter in the post with a small photograph of them driving on it was a physical photo driving on the bus lane mm. and this was in the 90s actually this mm. was some time ago or maybe early noughties and it was very funny i mean i was la it made me laugh uh, i don't know why they were caught red-handed so to speak it also seemed as if the um the car had been on a day out in london and it had sent back a kind of snapshot as a record of its um break you know or, or something like that and it, it got me thinking and also um um, it wasn't me that was driving, it was someone else. Um, so they had to pay the fine and um, the, the whole thing struck me as interesting. So you had the rollout of what are called APNR systems, um, Automatic Number Plate Recognition Systems, ANPR, I should say. And um, of course now there's a lot of uh, people, a lot of people are talking about the fact that um, most photography is taken and captured and never looked at by a human being. So you've got effectively a kind of computational network with technology capturing images through various kinds of cameras and then it's studied and looked at by technology as well so there's a whole world of images that human beings have nothing got nothing to do with but at the time it was quite a novel uh, thing to even imagine this system anyway uh, where i live in the south coast um, it was one of the first places where uh, traffic wardens or correctly i think they're correctly termed civil enforcement officers 
um, used photographic techniques to prove that cars were not illegally parked but badly parked and that would alleviate um, tensions when it came to asking people to pay the fines. So I was kind of interested in the possibility of getting these photographs but I couldn't imagine how to do it. I thought maybe I could, it occurred to me that possibly I could hire a car, I didn't have one at this point in 2008-9, um, park it badly, wait to get a ticket, then capture, then obtain the images which at that point would be downloadable. Um, anyway I was walking home one evening, I found a ticket on the footpath brought it home, typed in the PCN number, which I saw in front of that ticket, and the number plate, which is also on the fine. And I typed those numbers in, and I was able to access images of someone else's car, poorly parked, um, without having to pay the fine. Um, wow. So um, it was quite strange, quite mundane. Didn't know whether it was uh, ethical or not. Um, where, where were the I images? Began... Like how, who, who, where were the images taken from? Like a camera, like a street camera or something? Yeah, so all the all the traffic wardens, all the um, yeah. civil enforcement officers walk around with cameras and they take okay. a few photographs around the car. Mm -hmm. They've got a set of rules. In other words, they have to take pictures of the whole car, the front, the back. They generally take between six and eight images um, to give an indication of where it was and what had happened that was wrong. I mean, I checked it out in Skibbereen when I was doing that residency there in 2019 because there is... Um, I think there's one or two people that do the traffic, but there's a completely different, um, um, it's not as police intensive <laughs> as it is here, really. Yes. So um, anyway, I mean, there are various stories attached to this, but eventually I realized that I didn't even need to find tickets because the information was visible in front of it. It wasn't opaque. It wasn't sealed in a, an envelope. Mm. And I could just capture images using my own mobile device or write down the numbers and then go home. Generally you had to wait a day, so it was evocative of the times when you had to bring a film to the chemists to get uh, pictures uh, processed. Yes, yes. Um, you, you wait a day until the traffic wardens uploaded it and then uh, I began to collect these images of other people's unparked, badly parked cars. And I collected hundreds over a period of a year or two. And eventually interesting things started to happen. Um, I um, the CEOs sometimes captured themselves in reflection because cars are very reflective and shiny yes, yes. and these people are not trained photographers so they were revealing who they were right. um, and there's one particular very striking image um, that's the kind of police showing who they are through their own mechanisms. Yes, I call them police but these are low paid people doing kind of quite um, ordinary jobs they're not uh, they're very well they're very very skilled actually most people have a lot of a, mo a, a lot to say about parking meters and traffic wardens, but, but for the most part, they're pretty civil um, yeah, yeah. individuals. So uh, there were also, um, I began to follow them around and try to get into the photos as well. Um, so I would pretend to be on my phone, <laughs> standing nearby, lurking around them and following them and they would capture me and then I would, the following day, be able to download that. And then I also picked, I picked three images from this collection of hundreds, three night shots, a situation where a car was caught in the dark and I blew those up to the size of a car and made, a kind of, I made an exhibition in 2010. Um, and it was part of a photography biennial or that was going on at the same time. And as it happened, this was about um, everyday photography. And there were people like Martin Parr, and others around who noticed this show and then various things began to happen. They were interested in it. Most people who came to the exhibition to begin with, even though I'd put huge amounts of effort into it, were very hostile. Yeah. I mean, a typical reaction might have been, I'm not coming into this show. And I would say, like, you, you can always leave. It's voluntary. You don't have to be here. Mm. Um, so it wasn't um, playing the usual aesthetic games sure, perhaps yeah. or it wasn't seen as art photography but once um once martin power had made a speech um i was getting 50 to 100 people turning up um very interested indeed so um mm. that was a funny a funny switch as well and yeah. since then i've done lots of similar hacks i, I guess they, they'd be called gotcha but then just on the practical side of it would you not especially when you are trying to get images of yourself in these photos would you not have to find a poorly parked car yourself before the traffic officer or whatever shows up 
and just stand around waiting for them to show up. So this is the thing. Um, a lot of the work I do just requires a lot of time. I might be working slowly, lazily, on the lookout at all times. Generally speaking, as I say, I live in Brighton on the south coast and traffic or well, the parking um, situation seems almost like an industry. I mean, yeah. it isn't a big industrial town. It never was. Um, so perhaps uh, this is to make up. Um, but there's a lot of them around. So if you wandered through town at certain points, you'll simply see them in action. And I would basically, I wouldn't wait at a car that I saw a ticket. I would follow them and wait till they started to go through their ritual because they have to go through a ritual as well. They would, um, for example, they have to put their hat on before they issue a ticket and um, go through a kind of sequence of events. So it was almost like a pseudo-religious thing going on. Gotcha. And then... But then the question comes about the kind of legal aspect, one of you being able to access someone else's car photos and then, um, yeah, and then, you know, you said you had hundreds of them, you know, so you, you were, is that freely available online or were you just finding the tickets and taking the codes off them and stuff like that? So as I say, um, I've, that's a good question. Okay, in terms of legalities, I mean, first of all, the traffic warden photographs, technically speaking, the copyright is owned by the private company that they work for. I looked into this. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I, there was some coverage in the local press at the time I'd set up this exhibition, and luckily they covered it in a way that was sympathetic and treating it as um, funny or artistic rather than uh, subversive or dangerous. And I, I'm interested in things that are just below the radar yeah, that yeah. are... Possibly controversial, but not too controversial. Yes. And um, they covered it sympathetically and also invited the wardens themselves and the company down. Mm. And they stated quite openly they didn't mind. You know, they're more interested in the science of it than the art of it. And, and, and it worked. And then once you've got the endorsement of the art world, that helps as well. So the fact that people like Martin Parr, who's very prominent and well-known, um, support it makes it more legit. I mean, there is something called artistic license, um, which uh, nobody admits to it being the truth, but in most cultures and in most societies historically, and, and even the most oppressive ones, there's a little bit of leeway given to artists. Maybe not the Ireland of the 1920s and 30s when the likes of Samuel Beckett and James Joyce and even Flann O'Brien's books were, were sort of banned, you know, um, and in Britain and in other parts of the world, similarly, you would have had more censorship, but there's also a degree of freedom that's permitted. Um, mm. And it goes back a long way. I mean, I've looked into this. So yeah, there's some risks in terms of copyright, but this was before GDPR and I would like to, I'm, I'm in favor of GDPR. I'm in favor of regulation and it, from a political and from a, a kind of ethical point of view, I have got my own set of codes going on. So for example, I wasn't interested in exposing those traffic wardens. Of course. Sure. I produced, I produced a um, catalog of images I'd taken of them in action, but I really didn't want to play that game and go along with the usual sort of hostilities and so on. So, uh, but, but I, I think that, that GDPR is a good thing. And, and in some way, by, by revealing all, all the fact that this data is available underneath the surface, you, you might be helping to kind of expose it, if you see what I mean. So interestingly, in Brighton, where I live, as I say, um, shortly afterwards, the traffic system changed or the company changed its process. So they made the images, they made the tickets opaque. So you can't, you can no longer read them by just looking at them. Right. And they put a warning on to say that it's an offense to tamper with this, which you okay. get everywhere now. Mm. Now I'm not, I don't want to be too arrogant or egotistical with this, um, but maybe, maybe, maybe my project had something to do with that so I'm, maybe. You know, so maybe it helped to protect people's privacy i mean if it's there and it's easy to get yeah. and you obtain it and you show it to the world um that may well be so serving a useful or moral purpose sure so you would say that that was your or you get we'll just say enjoyment might not be the right word but you get more enjoyment from kind of uh showing these things to people and kind of somewhat opening their eyes to the things that are going on under the surface rather than like a uh, rebellious, stick it to the man kind of act, if you get me. Yeah, exactly. I think so. Um, I think um, being very punky and fingers up to the world is, um, well, apart from being a bit of a cliche, you know, 
there's something formulaic about it. Uh, you could argue that Donald Trump's got that attitude. You know, it's 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 quite a, a privileged. Um, it comes from a position of privilege. You know, celebrities and so on can can do this and get away with it um, a bit more. But I'm, I'm thinking out loud as I answer that question. I'm not sure. I would hate to live in a world where people weren't able. Where, where the repercussions of, of objecting or protesting or, you know, whether it's for creative reasons or for political reasons were, were restricted too much. Um, so the play between sort of tradition and conservatism and um, provocations that, that bring that into question, I think, I think is probably very important. Um, I mean, I'm ostensibly doing this with the word art involved. You know, I, I showed and ex I exhibited for that exhibition, which is a long time ago now. I've done a lot of things since. Of um, these night shots, you know, which is allusions to um, Caravaggio paintings, uh, black and white, oh, sorry, night shot, you know, lots of dark and then bright areas and mm. a certain kind of composition. Okay. And in a way, that's a joke, but also in a way, it's very serious. I mean, if I was to say something like um, compression codex, the JPEG, for example, in, in terms of photography and digital, Mm. was pre was pre empted by impressionism and uh, dabs and dashes and the fact that you didn't need pedantic detail to give the impression of something yes. so i think there are links to make with history and the history of art as well which which i i am interested in um, and that's a separate world in itself um it all started with the the car traffic thing and you said that, that was the event that kind of kicked off your current outlook on how to approach art yeah i did some similar um i mean things would happen accidentally in my everyday life and I, at the time my daughters were quite young and i was um you know taking care of them and, and i had a work to do as well and, and i had to bring in my so so i had i had to really integrate my everyday life into um my practice and I wanted to as well I mean that uh, romantic notion of the hero artist in their studio and I'm in a studio today but this kind of 50s idea the kind of abstract expressionist let's say which I've kind of really I'm really fond of some of that history but it's um, not really suitable and doesn't make sense in terms of the world we're now in so the idea of things happening to you day by day that you somehow discover something through observing in a particular way or having a particular set of insights or being true to who you are mm. as opposed to going along with everyone else yes. um, one thing leads to another mm -hmm. okay and so i mean i can give some i can give some examples but sure. maybe that would take up a lot of time uh, i mean there's material on my site i've sort of in the last year really done a huge amount of work um, creating a kind of an archive partly for myself and uh, to make it easy to kind of see the history. But um, um, I mean, the other project I mentioned, which was more controversial, was to do with these movements of packages. Um, yeah, you want to talk a bit about that? So, I, I mean, maybe I won't, maybe I won't, maybe okay. that one, uh, maybe I'll talk about um, something less. Um, so uh, in urban areas, as time went on, in big supermarkets or shopping centers, automatic uh, um, self-checkout machines were installed, right, to replace uh, human staff. Yes. And um, these machines uh, at first were moved in cautiously and then more and more of them, but they, um, they're sort of like, forms of robotics or artificial intelligence they kind of talk back to you and say thank you for shopping here um have a nice day would you like a receipt and so on well, you're, and it's, you're, it's you're sort of a, in decline that's the embarrassing one <laughs> well there's that too yeah um um yeah when they don't accept the card and there's no one to kind of hug or hope or beg and there's two or three um, people waiting behind you there you know yeah and the machine oh, doesn't yeah. know how to deal with the fact that you might just have to come back in five minutes yes. with uh having borrowed some money or something but yeah it would be good if they included uh, a loan if they gave you a loan while you were there maybe. yes 
But uh, I discovered anyway, when these were first rolled out, I went through all the machines in different supermarkets, different chains, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, um, the, the co-op, um, the ones um, around here in uh, wh where I live and Argos and so on. And I discovered that in Sainsbury's, and there's one near where I live, a big supermarket chain, do you have Sainsbury's? Is Sainsbury's existing? I don't think it exists in the Republic, does it much? I don't think so, but the uh, field so. supermarket in Skibri locally here, they've installed two of those um, self-checkout machines in the last six months or something. Oh, have they? Because I yeah. was in the, um, when I was here on the residency, or there in the residency in 2019, I was looking around and there was nothing. It was all very nice people talking to you and saying hello, that yeah. kind of stuff. They actually have a person um, stationed at those stations, so to because a lot of people don't know what they're doing with it and they'll just guide you through it so that in the future you know what you're doing well this is part of it this is what's funny so you install these machines yeah and then they don't really work properly or people can't use them so you need someone there ostensibly to help you yeah but they also feel like it also feels like you're working in a factory and they're the four person overlooking right. you yeah. they're not just there to help you they're there to check that you're not stealing stuff <laughs> Because yeah. um, we don't live in an ideal world, and if people can find ways around that, some will. Um, sure. And proof that that's the case is that in the one I mentioned now, where I live, there's security cameras to the tune of one for every machine, right? Mm. So every machine's got a screen on it looking at you while you're shopping. And not only that, there are security cameras above, and not only that, there are two or three people guiding you through, helping, watching out as well. Um, so. Yeah. Um, it's quite an ordeal, really. But anyway, I discovered initially that you could buy nothing mm. and that the machine would then thank you for shopping there, nevertheless, and give you a receipt that said zero on it. And this struck me as kind of exciting. Mm. And I began to use the machines to obtain these records, these receipts. Of, and, and I also created a tutorial kind of video uh, guide um, so that people could do it as well themselves and mm. i collected hundreds of of receipts from these machines uh, and the whole process felt very um pleasant really a kind of rhythm uh, kind of if you're standing next to one of these using i mean i'm not i didn't do this when there were queues i know you mentioned having people behind you i would you know that would have been pretty course, social so yeah. so i produced some books i produced some films and i produced uh, some documentation and instructions for people so that they could do it themselves if they wanted to. So you could go into a supermarket, go up to one of the self-checkout machines, uh, press certain buttons, buy nothing, get a receipt for it, and be thanked for having gone through that process. Brilliant, and it just brings a question up. With, with all the stuff, the projects you've been talking about recently, including this one, if I or anyone listening wanted to check that out, is that, you know, those um, exhibitions or, or anything like that, the, the, the books and guides, is there a place they can go to to see that up till a few months ago it wouldn't have been great but now i've really sorted everything out and if you go to my website moxim.org m-o-c-k-s-i-m dot org um, it's all there so I've, I've i've really gone to town in quite an obsessive way um, mm. during the last year when there was uh, more well, people say there was more time. There's not, there's not more time, is there? And just because of COVID doesn't, doesn't give people more time. It's been very frustrating and involved lots more work for, for many of us. Yeah. But for some reason, it didn't seem right to be making work or exhibiting or trying to further your um, engagement with the world in that way during yeah. the last year. So I, I just used it to hand code a kind of big website and um, find documentation of everything. So it's all neatly arranged there. Mm. Um, I'd be interested to know what people think. Brilliant. It's M, F M for Michal, O, mm. C. There, those are my initials, Mock, and then S, I, M, uh, Sim for simulation. So um, Mock Sim. I've, I've just used that as an online name for a good few decades, actually. Yeah. It goes back a long way. And I decided to kind of use it as a moniker, a kind of um, just a quick thing online. Um, and then when I had some, sh I had an experience. I was in, the, I had these exhibitions down in the south of France as part of um, a photography, and people started calling me Mr. Moxim and so on. 
so I, I started I started accepting it in that way for a while. But um, but the yeah, if you Google Moxim M O C K S I M, the website and the social media sites come up. Okay, great. Uh, um, so and then what are you working on? I suppose is the main question there at the moment. Firstly, I'm trying to finish off some collaborations that I've been working on, three of them, to get them out of the way that have got nothing to do with the reason for this residency, really. Mm. Um, but I'm, I've got this exhibition coming up at the West Cork Art Centre in 2022, and the idea is to prepare and start building up for that. Um, so when I was down in West Cork, Part of it was triggered by just trying not to just think about the lovely landscape and the Atlantic, like many people do. It's hard to resist, mm. but look at it. Look at it as more of a contemporary area. I mean, to be frank, West Cork and that area is is very cosmopolitan and mm. very diverse, and there's quite a lot of interesting things going on anyway. You know, so the, the historical differences between rural and urban are to a large extent undermined. Everyone's got access to the internet now. And, um, you know, I don't see much difference between the experience my daughters are having growing up in terms of that knowledge, at least. And my nephew is in Ballingarry and my daughter's here in Brighton and the South Coast. They all know about the same kinds of things. Sure. So I'm interested in technology and its relationship with bigger bureaucratic systems, systems that are there to help us, but might be there to control us. Um, and that, I don't mean that in a conspiracy theory way, um, yeah. and also, um, so I look, I'm looking at how the how the how the landscape is used. So um, wind turbines are a big deal; they're huge, they're magnificent in some ways. You can't mm. deny their how astonishing they are. Some people oppose them because they seem to be a blot on the landscape. Other people love them because they're green and they're meant to be green, at least. You know, we don't know if it's. Um, if there's business interests dominating and whether it's greenwash, but it seems it seems like a, a good thing to many people. I just I just want to observe neutrally and, and say, wow, they are huge and what's what's it all about? But also there are other ways the landscape has been used in the past, which people paid no attention to. For mm. example, golf courses um, exist and there are many of those around. And, you know, that's got questions associated with it too is that a good use of the of of these areas so i just had this idea of maybe combining the two could you turn wind for, could you turn golf courses into wind farms mm. and um change the game if for example you had one wind turbine on every hole could you modify the game so that that became a kind of an interesting obstacle it made the game more interesting in fact um so I've been going on TripAdvisor, finding mm. golf courses, and then posting this proposal there as a review, and also putting mock-up images of what the golf courses would look like if they had wind turbines in them as well. Okay. Generally speaking, people kick me off, and the low, and the the golf course just uh, they go on. They say you, we don't we don't accept this, and I get I get barred from TripAdvisor. Okay. Um, but a lot of them have succeeded. Um, so. The first one that succeeded is in Clara County, Offaly, where that there's some big golfer there who won a huge competition last year, and I managed to get one in there. And I've I've put a one for the there's a golf course in Dubai, Trump's golf course in Dubai, the Trump International. So I managed to put a review there in Arabic because you can use Google Translate to translate it into the uh, local language. And I I put up an image showing the golf course with wind turbines on it and they were very they seemed very happy they mm. they sent me a message saying thank you for your visit even though i hadn't visited i, I hadn't <laughs> actually been there i'd just mm. been to the Insta, uh, trip advisor site um, but it was kind of visiting i suppose right i, I went yeah. on a virtual visit to the golf course but they seemed very happy and they said you know come again and i found a golf course in brazil in the amazon rainforest and i i put the proposal there as well so it's a kind of ostensible, maybe arguably a kind of slightly adolescent <laughs> game, but um, uh, I'm just wondering where that's going to go. Really, yeah. it's, it's not the it's not it's not like the other kind of work that I, as I mentioned, I've been doing for the last ten years. It seems more in line with something else. So it's just combining two things together. There's a degree of surrealism involved. Maybe there's some 
comedic aspect to it. Um, possibly um, it's too jokey. I want to, I think there's a, uh, you know, there seems to be too much comedy in the world and I'm not interested in just um, playing that fool kind of game either. Gotcha. Um, yeah. You know, um, and I, yeah, so that's something to worry about. But uh, so, so how, how can you sort of be serious and at the same time not serious? Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's like it, it comes across a small bit like kind of prankstery, like you said, when you said adolescent, but, um, you know, just kind of you know, almost making fools of the of the people in the golf course that are just responding and giving, you know, uh, thanks for coming, even though they haven't really checked out the review kind of thing. But that's that's a good kind of humor, in my opinion, kind of thing, because it's just, uh, it just, you know, it's just probably just some some random guy like, uh, auto responding, you know, just because he has to. It's like... Um, if you have a YouTube channel and people give you their heart, you know, every comment on their channel just to show a bit of interaction, even if they've never even read the comment kind of thing. It's just a, you know, a positive response to get you keep coming back kind of thing. So that's, um, yeah, that's funny. So people, that's very good, actually. That's an interesting point. So in Dubai, basically, they, they were human beings behaving like robots. Mm. So that seems to be a characteristic of the contemporary world as well. You, sure. know, you phone people up who are working in a call center and actually people who work in supermarkets, not maybe the yeah. smaller ones, but in the bigger ones, they're following a script. Yeah. They're under instructions to say to you, have you had a nice day? Yeah. And sometimes they send managers through to check on them to make sure that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I mean, I've got some funny anecdotes that relate to that precise thing because my daughter discovered that someone who was working in the Sainsbury's next to me was following a script. She saw the, the crib list, really. Mm. Um, but but it's, it's sort of sad and we all do it as well and you need to do it, right? But it's, um, mm. but yeah, hopefully, yeah, pranks are one thing and maybe I'm trying to be a bit of, uh, I'm tr trying to, to locate this with an element of that in it, but I don't want to go too far in that direction. There's enough of it already on yes. in, in, in the national media. There's a lot of light entertainment. And, and then there's people like Banksy, who's kind of probably quite exciting, you know, but, but, but also uh, it's, it seems to me boringly one dimensional and didactic as well. Um, I prefer if this was like, you, you said something that I didn't think about before the fact that this person in Dubai had behaved like a machine mm -hmm. and, um, I think if you create work in a particular way and present uh, material to the world in a particular way, it can open up questions and, and simultaneously be sort of poetic. But then on, you, you said you you don't want it to be overly humorous or anything like that, and there's too much of that already, but then, so you would want people to somewhat take it seriously, but then what if, if in an ideal reaction, to some uh, of someone taking it seriously, what would their reaction be, kind of thing, you know, to the regarding the, the golf courses and um, wind turbines and stuff like that? Um, I don't know, but um, the reaction we're having now and the discussions I've had have all been fine. Mm. So let me go back to the traffic uh, warden project, and that's the wrong name. They're not called traffic wardens, they're called civil enforcement officers, CEOs, as if they are somehow high status in the way that um, company directors are, I guess, there's sure. something of that going on. Everyone's got the word manager, in, or not everyone, but a lot of people have you. But, but uh, one, um, so in, in, in preparation for the exhibition, I made some flyers and those flyers looked exactly like parking fine tickets, parking tickets. And uh, it was suggested to me that I should put them on cars along the streets near where the exhibition was taking place which I initially started to do. And then I thought, no, I'm going to take these off because that could have given someone a fright. Uh, it might've been uh, funny, um, but um, in a nasty way, to be honest. Um, yeah. And I, I just decided not to, even though that was very easy to imagine as something to do. I didn't, didn't really want to. I mean, I think they've shown them all recently, but do you remember at all, um, there was a, a series in the 70s or 80s in Irish TV, Murphy's Golden Movies, or? Um, uh, it just rings a bell. I wouldn't know, would know the ins and outs of it. I think they were showing some of the best of on Irish television, on RTE recently. It might yeah. be there somewhere. 
Um, but it was very funny. I mean, uh, it was the original kind of candid camera type pranksterism. So when something like that hadn't been done before, or let's say, let me think of someone like um, Sacha Baron Cohen and let's say the Ali G character. To some extent that was powerful for a while. Then it became the reverse of its former self. And now it's, uh, it, it has, it, it, it serves a different kind of purpose in the world. So, so I'm, I'm a bit uh, concerned about this. There's a spectrum perhaps uh, as one extreme, maybe people who take things extremely seriously the zealot, the believer, whether that's political ideology or religion or um, a conspiracy theory, or it could be business or science as well, actually, you know, sure. making money or um, believing in the, um, the, the, the potential for science or technology to save us. So that one extreme is, is taking something, being like that, being very earnest as an individual or as a society. And the other extreme is... Um, sarcasm, irony, cynicism, lampooning and joking about everything. Maybe there's a trajectory between those and maybe those are interesting ways to think about how to operate in the world. Um, I, I think most of us experience both and are both. Um, but I, I, if I feel myself going too far in one direction, I, I try to correct myself and come back. Um, mm. um, and likewise, the other way, you know. So I, I think I, I I think it's worth putting the feelers out um, to see whether you're um, slipping into becoming one of those extremes, um, and all of them are necessary. I think you know political change would never have happened if it weren't for um, and progressive political change. I mean, would never have happened if it weren't for people who were prepared to single-mindedly, in a very quite narrow way, devote themselves to something. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, we'd be living in a very strange world if you didn't have comedians, clowns, idiots, and, and the fool as, as a potential for us, and to be self-deprecating, to make, be able to make jokes of ourselves, of course. I mean, there are historical, political stereotypes as well that I'm conscious of. I mean, I'm older than you, Gavin, right? So I still remember what it was like to be in Britain when I was in my 20s and there being a certain kind of characterization of Irish people that was convenient for a certain purpose. I wouldn't like to think it was too malicious all the time, but the idea of being the joker or That's being uh, suited to certain kinds of jobs and other, other aspects of that, which, which I must say I resented and did experience. Um, so I'm, I'm slightly, I'm trying to be cautious of that too. Mm. I mean, I'm naturally inclined towards um, the idea of comedy and the idea of um, being quite happy uh, actually to make a fool of myself. Um, but I realize that people might take that the wrong way and, and yes. believe that I am uh, a fool. And I don't believe I am personally. And I, I think, um, you know, we all, we all, we all have a, a bit of that in us, but, but so. So as I say, I think a bit of caution in, in terms of those two extremes yes. is important to me and how I operate. Oh, okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, you don't want to be essentially you don't want to be tied down to any kind of um, representation of being, like you said, the fool or being like overly uh, political or um, or anything along that spectrum. I guess because it could potentially be harmful, and you don't you want to be more flexible and open than that. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Yeah. I mean, do you feel like that? Or, I mean, it seems to me, um, if you're, if you're characterized, if the world understands you and is, is able to neatly put you in a box, then you're in trouble. Your freedom is massively reduced and, and maybe autonomy and a certain amount of autonomy at least is important. Uh, otherwise life's not worth living. But if people, if people know you quite well, um, I would say it must be terrible for successful let's say musicians, artists, um, yeah. business people, or, or people that have become great actors, because to do something else then, people won't won't permit them really, they want them to stay in that box. Really. Yeah, I've always noted that, that people remember you for one thing, and um, you know, if you, uh, oh, that that actor wants to make a, a song now, it's like, it's almost laughable at the, at the concept, they'd be extremely talented and gifted people and, and put in all the work and might have a, a, a serious passion for music but people don't really take them seriously because they were one other thing beforehand or else there's a overly positive reaction to it i love that actor and now that he's making this music even if it's crap i'm going to love it because i love that actor i think it's interesting yeah it's certainly a big factor at least isn't it if um 
I mean, I, I suppose we we do live in a world where, where where people, some people at least, seem to want to become prominent regardless what for. Yes. But if yes. you're if you're pursuing what you're interested in, and then you you get noticed for that, it, it can be a real pain, I think. Um, so there's more dimensions to people than one. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, do you think people who are involved in something called art uh, should be talking about other things as well, like politics? And well, I suppose art is a kind of reflection of life, and you know your own take on things. It can be about all sorts of you know it's it's limitless what it can be about, but um, um, it depends if it if, you know does that get in the way does politics does whatever it may be get in the way of your um what you're trying to achieve um with the art and what you're trying to achieve might be open I, you know i've met some artists that are that are just trying to um make people think and then you ask them make them think about what and they don't they don't know and they don't want to know the answer they just want to make people think and um and and that's totally valid and appreciated too so Maybe that's important, actually, to um, admit that you don't know everything and to sort of be open to the uncertainty. I mean, that's uh, a third way of functioning. Um, how's your podcasting going? I went to see one of the Blind Boy things in Skyrene mm. when I was there, and I do kind of follow him a bit. But uh, once again, that's become... I think there's something about the crudeness in his ways and um, I like the people he brings on and the fact that he's got a way of bringing on some very interesting characters but that too you see I think to begin with kind of interesting enough now it becomes a bit overwhelming and a kind of routine mm -hmm. to um, sort of worry about a bit uh, and you know it's really great the way he brings some sort of mental health issues to the fore as well um, that's kind of valuable yeah um whether you know uh, yeah yeah so uh i think that's his like main or one of his main qualities which is probably the wrong word is the, that he talks about the mental health stuff because i think a lot of people in my generation and below are and not, not excluding people above are facing mental health problems in today's today's day and age kind of thing especially with the lockdown and having someone that talks about that and isn't afraid to talk about that and then has that element of comedy to kind of lighten the mood afterwards is is um very welcome um needed yeah he spoke to pat bracken in skibbereen the mm. he's part of the critical psychiatry network and i found him really intriguing i've sort of checked him out since but uh yeah uh since i mean there, there's been ups and downs in terms of let's say suicide rates and all kinds of other things in the last few decades um but part of it presumably is to do with repression and people not being prepared to admit that um the bad times feeling low and crisis are part of life if anything they're what makes life importantly interesting as well i mean a lot of people i know that have come through mental health problems and out the other side are the better for it mm. and there are a lot of people out there who don't admit that they could possibly have a breakdown let's say who um i would say are boring and sort of uh, need one perhaps yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it's it's um it's it's good that these things are talked about you know um if you live in a mad world um it would seem strange to me that people are not behaving um strange people pretend that it's not mad and just operate in a routine way you know i mean Absolutely. things mm -hmm. things are quite crazy i mean covid's been a it's kind of foregrounded the precarity with which we exist mm -hmm. all right michael i could probably talk to you for four hours it's very 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 interesting but i do need to wrap it up unfortunately yeah but i really appreciate your um your time and uh it's fascinating and i'll we'll put up all the links anyway for people to check it out when they want to and i'm sure they will after listening to this great thank you cheers for the attention illin west cork art center podcast
This podcast is brought to you by Inn West Cork Arts Centre and made possible with support from the Arts Council, Cork County Council and Departments of Social and Family Affairs. The Hall O'Connell's residency at Illin in 2021 is kindly supported by the Arts Council Commission Award. More information about Illin West Cork Arts Centre's studio residency programme can be found on our website and social media.